the uh, WRKF uh, website. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us tonight. Uh, tonight's program features research by biologist Dr. Karen Maruska, who studies how animals communicate and how the social environment influences behavior, brain function, and reproductive capacity. Her study species is the African um, cichlid? cichlid, learned a new word today, cichlid fish, or A. bertoni. And much of her current work is focused on how these fish are visual, acoustic, and chemo, uh, chemosensory signaling during reproductive and aggressive behaviors. Dr. Maruska is also an advisor for and contributor to, to Bert's blog, created by her former PhD student, Dr. Julie Butler, and a new comic book created by her current PhD student, Rose Wayne, where you can read all about the fascinating research discoveries made at the Maruska Lab. And you can get a copy if you haven't already at the front. Um, LSU Science Cafe's goal is to continue to build a strong and informed community by providing access to reliable information, new ideas, and cutting edge information from faculty across the, from faculty experts and researchers across the university. Tonight's event is brought to you in partnership with local public radio station WRKF 89.3, your source for programs like Science Friday, the TED Radio Hour, and Hidden Brain. See the program schedule at wrkf.org. WRKF will be giving away an NPR beverage tumbler to one lucky audience member here tonight, and we'll announce the winner at the end of the program. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Karen Maruska is an associate professor in the LSU Department of Biological Sciences. She graduated with a BS degree from the University of New Hampshire and received an MS degree at Florida Tech and a PhD at the University of Hawaii. She was awarded a Grass Fellowship in Neuroscience at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole and was a National Institutes of Health post postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. Her research has used fishes as vertebrate models to study how sensory systems function, how hormones influence sensory processing, and more. After the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. To participate here, simply raise your hand. But if you're online, contribute to the RKF Facebook page, and we'll present the questions here uh, at the Varsity. Uh, we'll be monitoring the page, and we look forward to hearing from all of you. And now. I'll turn it over to Dr. Karen Maruska. I'll try not to fall off the stage tonight. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you, Steve. Thank you all for coming tonight. So today I wanna to tell you a little bit about some of my lab's research that is focused on fish communication. And I'll tell you a little bit about how fish communicate using this um, charismatic, fish that we have here in the next slide that doesn't seem to be advancing. <laughs> Let's see, is this gonna work or is, okay, I can go back. Okay, thanks. So we're gonna use this African cichlid fish as the system that we work on in my lab. And so I'm also gonna to touch on how we try to communicate our science just to a wider audience in sort of fun and creative ways. And so communication is just the transfer of information through the environment from a sender to a receiver. And then the receiver needs to decide what to do with that information depending on the context. And so for today, I'm gonna to talk about communication in a reproductive context. So how are males and females finding each other, getting together to mate so that they can make little baby fishes? All right, so for tonight, I want you all to imagine that you are a fish, that you're swimming around underwater, you're interacting and communicating with your neighbors, with your friends, maybe with some strangers. And to actually do this properly, you need to recognize that the perceptual world of a fish is very different from how we perceive the world. And that brings us to this concept called sensory umwelt. 
And so the sensory Umwelt is a German term that just describes the environment of an animal. And so it, how an animal um, perceives its world is very dependent on the physical properties of the environment. So underwater versus air, for example, as well as the sensory and perceptual abilities of that animal. So how does their nervous system encode different, different signals? And so to really appreciate how fish communicate, we sort of need to put ourselves in the head of a fish and delve into their underwater world. So the star of our show tonight is this African cichlid fish called Estatotilapia bertoni. And as um, Steve struggled to pronounce the word cichlid, if you need help remembering how to pronounce it, one of my undergrad students made this graphic. So it's a cichlid with a cichlid on his head. <laughs> and so hopefully you'll remember that. This species lives in shallow shore pools and river systems of Lake Tanganyika, which is the largest, oldest, and deepest lake of the African Rift Valley system in Eastern Africa. There's also a population that lives here on LSU campus in the life sciences building that we use for our, for our research. And so I wanna introduce you to the two main characters in our story tonight. First is Bert. Bert is a dominant territorial male. He's very brightly colored and he spends his days defending his territory from rival males and also trying to entice females into his territory to spawn. Then we've also got Tony. Tony is a female fish and she has a very interesting reproductive cycle, which I'll go through in a minute, but she has a period of her life where she's um, very focused on the signals that Bert is putting out into the world, and another phase of her reproductive cycle where she's in a parental care mode and doesn't really care what Bert's doing. And so a few years ago, we um, were trying to think of sort of creative ways to share our science with a wider audience, everyone from other scientists to the general public to, to kids. And what we came up with was basically using these fish cartoon characters with names and personalities to, to, to sort of tell stories about, about our research. And so I'm gonna use these fish characters today to talk through how these fish communicate. And so we're totally anthropomorphizing these fish here, but it helps people to relate to them and to care about the animals and to really be interested in how research is done on these animals and what discoveries we make and what it means to the fish. So before I get to the communication, I need to um, tell you a little bit about some of the characters here. So first, if we talk about the male. So the males in this species exist in two different types. They're either dominant like Bert or they're subordinate like Tyrone. Bert is really brightly colored. He has a territory that he very aggressively defends from all other males. And he uses this to try and attract females like Tony for spawning. Tyrone, on the other hand, is subordinate. He's very drab colored, similar to females. He hangs out with the females and the other subordinate males. And he basically gets beat up all day by, by Bert. He gets chased around the tank. And if you watch this video, even for a couple seconds, it's really easy to tell which one of those fish is Bert and which one is Tyrone. Tyrone also has um, really tiny testes. So these are the testes. <laughs> compared to the large testes that Bert has. And so he also has very few reproductive opportunities. The cool thing about this fish though, is the males can switch back and forth between these two types, depending on what's going on in the social environment. So if for example, Bert disappears from the population, he gets eaten by a predator, Tyrone can very quickly take over his territory and within just a few minutes, he'll change his body coloration just to look just like Bert and he'll start doing all these behaviors, dominance and reproductive behaviors that um, Bert was doing just five minutes earlier than that. Okay, so we're gonna focus on Bert tonight because he's the one that's really trying to attract females like Tony for spawning. And the spawning um, behavior of these guys is, is super interesting. And so once Bert has convinced Tony to follow him into his territory to spawn, she is gonna go down and lay some eggs on the substrate, which you'll see in a second right there. She immediately turns around and picks those eggs up in her mouth. 
Then Bert comes down and he has an anal fin that has egg spots on it. Tony goes over and, and nips at those egg spots because she thinks they're eggs she needs to pick up. That stimulates Bert to release sperm directly into her mouth to fertilize those eggs. Then those eggs sort of develop inside the female's mouth. And then Tony becomes what's called a mouth brooding female. So she'll hold on to those babies as they develop for two weeks in her mouth. And during this time, she doesn't eat. So she basically starves herself for her kids. And then being the good, the good mother that Tony is, once she releases those babies, she will actually take care of them for another few days by letting them swim back into her mouth if they're threatened by a predator. And it's a little hard to see in that video, but if you watch, you'll see a bunch of little baby fish swimming up to the mother and basically waiting in line for her to take them back in. And after a while, the fish get too big to fit in there and then they're kind of on their own. Okay, so cichlids have a bunch of different sensory systems that they can use to communicate during reproduction. And I'm gonna take you through how they use vision, lateral line, hearing, and olfaction to communicate in this reproductive context. We don't know much about taste and it's not thought to function in social communication. So we haven't really looked at that one yet. All right, so I wanna start off with vision because vision is definitely the most important and dominant sense in these cichlids. So once Bert decides that he's going to start courting Tony, he is gonna intensify his body coloration. So all the greens, yellows, and blues in his body just get more vibrant. The red patch on the side of his, his body, all of his little spots on his fins all get just more intense. We also see that um, he's gonna increase a lot of his behavior. So he quivers his body at Tony, he chases her around the tank, and he does these sort of slow tail waggles to try and get her to follow him into his territory. We also know that males like Bert can basically recognize when a female is ready to spawn just by looking at her. So she'll increase her reproductive behaviors just by looking at visual signals from Tony. Now, Tony over here is getting all kinds of visual signals from Bert, the body movements from the behaviors as well as coloration changes. And one of the cool things that we discovered a couple of years ago is that Tony's vision actually changes with her reproductive cycle. So as she's getting close to spawning, her vision actually gets better and it may allow her to better detect some of the visual signals that Bert is, is giving her so that she can make a better decision about who she wants to mate with, whether, whether it's Bert or, or some other fish. All right, in addition to visual signals, Bert also makes grunt-like sounds towards Tony. And I'm gonna play the video first so you can see and hopefully we'll hear the sound production. And then I'll talk a little bit more about, about the sounds. <laughs> okay, now it's back, okay. Um, so here's Bert. And he's in a tank with Tony and some of her friends. And that black thing hanging down in the middle is a hydrophone that's just picking up the sounds. And he's going to make two of these courtship grunts. And these are the two waveforms that are on the bottom there of the sounds that you'll hear. All right, so the sound isn't playing, but it sounds like this. It's like, so it's a little grunt grunt like sound. This is not the first time I've had to do a fish sound in a talk. <laughs> so, okay, so Bert does these, these sounds when he quivers his body towards Tony. And the sounds are only made when he does this body quiver, but importantly, not every quiver is associated with sound production. So that means that he's producing these sounds intentionally, and they're not just a byproduct of his body movements. We also know that the sounds are pulse. The pulses vary depending on the individual and even within an individual. The sounds are very low frequency. So they're between about 200 and six or 700 Hertz. And they're not very loud. So they're usually produced when Bert and Tony are very close to each other. So it's likely a very close range communication system. We also know that the peak frequency of the sounds coming from the males is related to his body size. So large males produce lower frequency sounds and small males produce higher frequency sounds. 
And Tony can actually use this information as an honest indicator of male body size and potentially other fitness characteristics of, of the male. We know that Tony also cares about these sounds. So if you give females a choice, whether they wanna hang out with a male that is just making visual signals versus a male that's making visual signals and producing these sounds, she definitely wants to hang out with the male that's also making sounds. So these, these sound signals are also really important in this species. Uh, okay. So one of the questions I often get when I talk about sound production in fishes is, well, fish don't have ears, right? How are they detecting these sounds? Well, fish do have ears. They just don't have external ears like we do to hang our earrings on. They do have internal ears, which are very similar in a lot of ways to our, to our own inner ears. And so fishes use what are called otolithic end organs for hearing. There are these structures that are very close to where the, um, on the sides of the brain. And fish have three different organs, the saccule, the lagina, and the utricle. The saccule is the largest organ, and it's thought to be the main hearing organ in most fish species. And on these organs, we have um, some sensory hair cells. And on top of those hair cells is what's called an otolith. And this is a calcium carbonate structure that is the same structure that scientists use to age fish because as a fish grows, it actually lays down sort of rings in this structure and you can count the number of rings to figure out how old the fish is. So when a sound arrives at, um, at Tony, it basically moves her entire body in phase with that sound signal. The, the movements are very subtle. It's not something you can see with the naked eye, but because that otolith is much denser than the surrounding fish tissue, you get sort of a shearing motion between the otolith and the hair cells that stimulates those hair cells and then sends information to the brain about what that signal is. And so unfortunately this little animation here, um, oh, now it's working. That's weird, it wasn't working earlier. So you can see that and the hair cells. Okay, so we can also look at the hearing of this species by sticking electrodes over their, their brain and playing sounds to them through an underwater speaker to look at how they respond to different frequencies and intensities. And then we just measure the brain wave responses. So this technique is very similar to having an EEG done. So you have those little caps that you put on your head with the little suction cup electrodes that you move as brain waves. And so we measure hearing in Tony when she is either receptive, so getting really close to spawning, or when she's in that mouth breeding state when she doesn't really care what, what's going on with bird. And what we found is that her hearing is actually two to five fold better when she is in this um, receptive state getting close to spawning compared to brooding. And interest interestingly, the frequency that she's best tuned to are the same frequencies that are in the sounds that Bert is making. So as she gets close to spawning, not only does her vision improve, but her hearing also gets better specifically so she can detect these courtship sounds from Bert. And she can use this information to determine which male she wants to spawn with. We also know that this change in auditory sensitivity is at least in part due to hormones, specifically estradiol. If you block estradiol production in these females, their hearing gets worse. And so estradiol is somehow improving their hearing ability as they get close to spawning. All right, so Bert's making these visual signals. He's also producing these sounds. And another thing he's doing is as as he's shaking his body towards Tony, he's basically pushing water at her also. And fishes have a sense that we don't have, which is the lateral line system that they use to detect these water movements. And so the lateral line system is a series of sensory receptors found on the head and all along the body of the fish. They're called sensory neuromasts. Um, they can either be on the skin or underneath the skin in canals. And each one of these green dots on this fish here, oops, represents a, um, a single neuromast. And these neuromasts are basically a collection of sensory hair cells that are very similar to the hair cells in the inner ear. And it's covered by this gelatinous cupola. 
And so when a water movement goes past the fish, it moves this cupula and it stimulates those hair cells to send information to the brain about what that water movement was. And so if Tony is using these water movement signals from Bert to make mating decisions, then if we eliminate her lateral line system, we should see some changes in her behavior. And that's exactly what we see. So when, when Tony's lateral line is intact and she can feel those water movements from Bert, she shows an increase in her positive following response, meaning that she's more willing to follow Bert into his territory. And the majority of times that leads to the full spawning sequence. If we ablate Tony's lateral line, so now she can't feel those water movements from, from Bert, she shows a decrease in those, in those following responses, and most of the time it doesn't lead to spawning. So these water movements are also really important for Tony being able to, to choose which male to spawn with. All right, chemosensory signaling is um, a really fun one to study in fishes because one of the ways that fish will chemically signal to each other is through their urine. And so we, we normally can't see their urine, but if we take a harmless blue dye and we inject it into the fish, it gets concentrated in their bladder. And then every time they pee, you can see this little blue pulse come out that we can then quantify. And so I'm gonna play this video that's gonna show you that. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to look right about here and you'll start to see a little blue plume come out of, of that fish when, when she's peeing. This is a female and she's peeing in response to another fish across the barrier there. And so these chemical signals in fish are really interesting because they're essentially honest signals. So the fish can't control what it's releasing through its urine. And so it's a direct reflection of their health, their nutritional status and their reproductive status. the productive cycle, similar to what happens with the visual and the auditory system. And I'm just going to show you one example of that in the males here. So in these experiments, we recorded from um, neurons in the region of the brain that processes olfactory information. And then we can pass different chemicals over their noses and see how these neurons change their firing patterns. And so I'm showing you neurons here in, in either BERT or in Tyrone. And so when we pass water that had contained some behaving and receptive females over the nose, pass male water over their noses, we actually see the opposite effect. So Bert's olfactory system doesn't really respond to those male waters very well, but Tyrone really does. His neurons start firing like crazy. And this makes sense in this species because Bert's the one that has the territory and he's gonna be spawning with those females. So he really needs to pay attention to the chemicals released by females so he can better tell which females are ready to spawn so he can direct his effort towards them. Tyrone on the other hand, remember has really tiny testes. He doesn't have a territory. So he has very few reproductive opportunities. So he's not too concerned about the chemicals that are released from females. It's not his priority. But what he is doing is he's monitoring all the other males in the population to figure out which male he may be able to challenge and then take over his territory, territory holding male. And there's evidence in a lot of fish species that their dominant status is conveyed through chemical signals that they release in their urine. So it makes sense for Tyrone to be monitoring this information. Okay, another thing we're doing in the lab is trying to really understand which regions of the brain process all of this different sensory information. So Tony during reproduction is getting all these different sensory information from, from Bert. And so we're looking at which regions of the brain are important for integrating this information. And because these brain regions, regions are really well conserved from fishes all the way up through mammals, we can all insights into how this multi-sensory information is processed in other animals, including in, even in humans. Okay, so I want to sort of end here on talking about some of the ways that we have been communicating our science with a, a wider audience. And the goal here is really to um, make the science a little bit more accessible so that people aren't so intimidated by it and they're willing to engage more and learn more about the research that we're doing and the importance of the research. Great artist. 
And this comic was designed based on one of our actual published research studies, where we looked at how um, repeated social defeat or bullying in these male fish causes changes in their behavior and their brain. And so we were interested in looking at whether delivering the science content in a comic book form might give some benefits in terms of both learning about the science itself, as well as just improving people's perception of, of science. And so we were actually able to use this comic recently in an education study. So we had cohorts of undergraduate students here at LSU that were in a biology for non-majors class. And we gave them the same content just delivered in different formats to read. So either they got to read the actual original science paper that was published as it would appear in the journal, they got a short news summary about that same study, or they read the comic book that is designed off of that same study, or that the controls read nothing. And we gave them pre and post tests to see how much they learned about the science content from each of these different media and how much their perception of science might have changed. And so these results are still being analyzed by Rose, but it's exciting that it looks like the preliminary results show that the comic books, so students that read the comic actually had higher learning gains from the other groups. They learned more about the scientific study that we were um, presenting them. And they also showed improved perceptions of science. So students that may have been a little bit more intimidated about reading about science beforehand were much more likely to do so after they read the comic compared to the other sources. So comics may be a really good way to share our science with um, a wider community. And, and it's also super fun and interesting to look at, right? You got cute fish characters. We even have neurons with googly eyes and everything. So what more could you want? <laughs> And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. And if you're interested in getting um, links to Bert's blog or to the comic, you can also download it online. You can go to our website. You can scan the QR code that'll take you directly to our lab website where you can um, see all of this information. You can follow the lab on Twitter if you wanna see what we're up to now. And unfortunately this video isn't, isn't gonna play because it's a weird format. But we have our version of the um, locker room wind bar above the, the door to our lab. So it's a, a painting of, of Bert with his fin down and says, have a fantastic day. And so the students can go through the lab and sort of high five or I guess high fin Bert on their way out um, after they've done a, a great day of science and science communication. And I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Little, it's a little hard to see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, how long is the, the female's reproductive cycle? So how long is it between when she's mouth brooding to when she gets to be able to spawn again? The cycle is a, around 28 days. So once she spawns, she holds on to those babies for two weeks, and then we'll take care of them for a few more days after that. And then she'll begin to grow her eggs up again for the next spawning cycle. So in theory, these guys are, are year round spawners, so they don't have a seasonality. So approximately every month or so, the female can, can have new babies again and, and go through the spawning cycle. And the number of babies they have varies depending on the size of the fish. It can be as few as you know like 10, but it can also be up to 50 babies. You know, and so you can imagine having to cram 50 babies in your mouth for, <laughs> for two weeks. It's, it's probably pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How does Tony protect her babies? So the way she protects them is she lets them swim back into her mouth. So if there's a predator that's coming by, they like to eat little babies and actually other fish in the tank like to eat these babies as well. So she'll let them swim back into her mouth. And once they're in her mouth, a predator or another fish can't, can't eat them. So she's just giving them a little shelter. Yeah. Um, can a Tyrone become a bird or is he a subordinate? No, he can become a bird. So they can go back and forth in both directions. So the question was, can Tyrone become a Bert and convert, become a Tyrone? And the answer is yes to, to both. So 
If you remove Bert, Bert Tyrone can become a Bert. And if you remove, um, or if you force Bert to become subordinate like Tyrone, he will do, would do the same thing in the opposite direction. There's some differences in the timing of how quickly they do it, but the coloration changes in both directions happen within minutes. So they either intensify their coloration if they're going up in status, or they dull their coloration if they're going down in status and becoming submissive. Some of the physiological changes take, um, take a little bit longer, but they can happen anywhere from 15 minutes to a week. So it's, it is relatively quick actually in, in the greater scheme of things. <laughs> uh, question, yeah, you have another one? <laughs> Does Bert try and protect Tony? No. Um, Bert will harass Tony until she spawns pretty much. <laughs> and if she's not interested, she'll, she'll sort, of, sort of swim away from, from him. But after they spawn, it's all Tony's job to take care of those babies. Bert just turns around and tries to get another, another Tony or another female to spawn with. So he'll continually try and spawn with multiple females even after he's already um, reproduced with, with Tony. Yes, Bert will, Bert will aggravate her for sure, yeah. But it's all in a loving way, right? He's really trying to get her to come in, come in and spawn with him, so. <laughs> Yes. Yep. They're both trying to make babies. Yep. But he eventually got his way and, and Tony said yes after a bunch of bullying and they decided to spawn. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. So the question is, um, the, the dominant subordinate relationship is that all related to sort of ag aggression and yeah. And it, it's also based on size. So generally a, a larger male will become dominant um, over a, a smaller male, but it's all figured out through aggressive interaction. So I didn't have time to talk about the, the aggression, but there's a lot of really interesting sensory signaling that goes on between males um, together. And so they fight constantly over territories and you know a subordinate male can challenge a dominant male at any time when he feels like he's up to it. And sometimes he'll win over that territory and the, the Bert goes away and the new Tyrone takes over. Sometimes he loses and, and has to go elsewhere and try and you know make do with, with what he's got until he gets a chance to take over a territory. So yeah, it's definitely aggression. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure if they're, sorry, the question was how long do these fish live and is their lifespan different by gender? I don't know if it's different by gender. Um, in the lab, they can live for several years and I'm told that the same is true in the wild. When, when, Fish, when males especially are dominant, they are much more conspicuous to predators. And so they are in a lot more danger of being picked off by a, a bird predator in their habitat or something um, when they're in that flashy coloration and doing all these, all these behaviors. But they definitely live for, for several years is probably the, um, the lifespan. So yeah, sorry, I'm not looking at this side. <laughs> you wanna go first? <laughs> There's no silly questions. <laughs> so we measured her um, visual sensitivity by looking at the response of her retina. Sorry, I didn't repeat that question. So how do we know that the female's vision and hearing um, gets better as she's getting close to spawning? So for the retina, we, we actually measured the retinal sensitivity and you can flash different wavelengths of light at the female when she's receptive and then when she's not receptive. And we see improvements in her visual sensitivity. So her ability to detect different wavelengths of light it's just more sensitive when she's getting close to spawning. And the same thing with the hearing. If you compare females that are um, receptive with nice big eggs in their abdomen that are getting really close to spawning, their um, auditory sensitivity, if you play sounds to them, 
they detect those sounds at a much lower threshold than they would when they're in a brooding state and they don't really care about these courtship sounds from, from males. So just comparing their, their, their sensitivity with physiological measures in and out of their receptivity time. Yeah. You're next. <laughs> so being fish is tough enough to get their third year, third year review. Um, right, they do a lot of work in your lab. But, uh, yes, um, they do. But so, so my, so my question is, uh, what do they actually receive? Do they see the same, do they see the same frequencies that we do? Do they have the same rods and bones and eyes? So are they seeing something that's yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, do they, what are they seeing? Do they see the same types of, of wavelengths that we, do, that we do as humans? And the answer is um, probably not. So we, if you think about our eyes, we have three different cone colors, red, green, and blue. These, this species of fish actually has seven different cones. And so they can see down into the UV range. And so UV vision is something that's actually pretty common in a lot of fish species. And so we have no idea what that looks like, right? And bees can see in the UV as well. And so flowers look different to them than they do, than they do to us. And so there's a lot of visual signaling that's probably going on that, again, we can't understand. And that's that whole concept of the animal's own belt. You really need to think about what their perceptual abilities are and how ours are different. And then we may miss things sometimes because we're not thinking about their physiological capabilities. They also have rods as well. Um, and so they can, they only do these behaviors during the day. So they're not sort of night fishes. So they kind of just float around and aren't doing any behaviors um, at, at night. It's all during the day. Right. Not not really, no. Yeah, we don't know a whole lot about what they are actually seeing. You can flash different wavelengths of light and look at their retinal sensitivity, but it's kind of a crude measure. And yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot fewer studies that look at visual processing actually in the brain past, past the retina. But we do know that their change in visual sensitivity is probably due to um, hormonal changes that are actually occurring in the retina that modify how that retinal information gets passed from the eye into, into the brain. So yeah, super interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how do we ablate the lateral line to um, to block Tony's ability to sense these water movements? There's a few ways that you can uh, ablate the lateral line, and the, what we did in this experiment was for the the lateral line that goes along the the body, we clip the nerve. So they're just not getting that information from the body into the brain. And then there's some chemicals that we can use to ablate the lateral line. And so we use antibiotics that will basically destroy the hair cells of the lateral line system and make them not functional. There's some other chemicals that you can use to ablate the lateral line system that aren't quite ideal because we've shown that these chemicals can also block the olfactory system. So they basically kill off the olfactory epithelium also. And so then you can't be sure what you're looking at is lateral line versus olfaction. Um, the ablations that we do, if you clip the nerve, that's not reversible, although it will grow back over many weeks. The antibiotic treatment, um, 
can be reversible depending on the concentration that, that you use to ablate the lateral line. But after these experiments, we're collecting the animals to look at where the information is processed in the brain. So we haven't really played around too much with trying to, to reverse the effects of the, of the ablation for the lateral line. Oh, some questions in the back there, <laughs> Steve. Uh, there's, uh, yes, there was. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, um, a while back, there was a study that came out that showed that you could put goldfish in a tank and they could basically be on this little robot thing and could guide the motion of this robot in, in on, on land, essentially. <laughs> and I actually gave a couple quotes to popular mechanics about that because they asked me about that study. And I think it would be similar if, if you go underwater without goggles on, you can sort of see things underwater, right? But everything's just super fuzzy because our eyes are designed for air and not for water. I think the same thing would happen with the goldfish in that environment. So they may be able to see the structures to be able to nav navigate that little robot car, but they're gonna be sort of blurry. And the whole point of that paper was that fish can use basically um, cues in the environment to navigate through their environment. And I think, yes, they can absolutely do that um, from, those, from those experiments. They have all the right neural structures to be able to, to use signals in the environment or to use objects and to navigate toward them. Just like we could do underwater swimming in a pool or on a coral reef, we can be like, okay, I, I see that coral head over there, I'm gonna swim towards it, but I really don't know what it is, it's, it's super blurry. So yeah, I think it, it can definitely happen, but the visual capabilities are gonna be sort of fuzzy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so the question I think is, are there other species that do this mouth brooding behavior? Yes, absolutely. There's a whole bunch of different fish species that are mouth brooders. There's even a, at least one frog species that, um, that does this, this mouth brooding. And it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's widespread, but there are a bunch of fish species. In some species, it's the mother that does the mouth brooding. In other species, it's the dad that does the mouth brooding. And then there's situations where both parents sort of take care of, of those babies. The timing of that mouth brooding varies widely from a few days to um, many, many weeks. So depending on the species. Yeah, so the question is what, what's their hearing range, essentially, what frequencies do they, do they hear? And so as in most fishes, they're most sensitive to frequencies of one kilohertz and below. So the sound production is around 200 to 700 hertz or so, um, but most fishes don't hear really well at very high frequencies above one kilohertz. And so if you think about our hearing, you know, we hear from, you know, anywhere from 50 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And so it's at the lower end of, of our hearing range. Most fishes hear very well at low frequencies. And sound actually travels five times faster underwater than it does in air. And so a lot of underwater animals can detect sounds at much greater dis distances because the speed of sound is so different, especially low frequencies, which propagate a lot further. And then you have underwater animals, you know, like, like whales and things that, you know, can hear much, much different frequencies, um, depending on what's, what species of, of whale they are. And, you know, you've got species that hear in the ultrasound, like bats that can hear super, super high frequencies that we can't hear either. Um, but fish are definitely on the lower end of, of the frequency range. You have a question? Which one was more popular? You mean which, which sensory system is more popular? Sort of? Yeah, so the vision is definitely the dominant sense in this species. But what seems to be happening is that they're getting lots of extra information from these other sensory channels. So they can do most, mostly everything with just vision, 
But when you add these other senses like the chemical signals or the sound production, they often will dramatically increase their, their behavioral responses. So it seems that they're, these other senses are just providing extra information that they can get from um, that opposite sex or even the same sex in, in certain conditions. But vision in these guys is, is definitely dominant. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is this, is this the only species that we study? Right now, yes. Um, one of the reasons is we have such a great history of knowledge on this species already. And so we can continue to ask more probing hypotheses as, as we go along. We, we also have the genome published for this species, which is, allows us to look at you know, molecular level changes that might be um, functioning in some of these sensory systems. And this fish was, I worked on it as my as a postdoc, and it was originally collected from Lake Tanganyika in the 1970s by my postdoc advisor. And he brought this population of fish back to the United States. And then since then, it's been perpetuated in the lab and it's used by a whole bunch of different labs around the world because it's become such a really great model system for, for studying all kinds of biological um, questions. You know, we have a lot of work that we do in the lab that looks at the parental care of the species as well, as well as aggression context. And so a lot of things I, I wasn't able um, to, to talk about, but we haven't done a whole lot with, with other um, species of, of fish. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so the question is, are, are they monogamous at all? And do the sub males kind of sneak in? Um, they are not monogamous, definitely. So Bert will basically try and court and spawn with anything that swim past, swims past him. <laughs> um, the females will also, you'll sometimes even see them lay a few eggs with one male, pick them up, get them fertilized, and then go over and visit another male. So she may have a clutch that actually has multiple fathers. And then the thing with the subordinate males, so they aren't really reproducing, but they do sneak. And so if you have a dominant male like Bert and Tony that are spawning, we have seen Tyrone basically swim right down and insert himself between the pair and try and spawn with, with that female. So he's again, making the best of his bad situation with those tiny testes, but he still has sperm and he can still fertilize eggs by using that strategy. So yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah. How are they able to change their colors? Is that the question? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. They have these, you know, melanocytes and, and different chromatophores in their skin that basically expand or contract depending on um, what's going on. Some of it's probably hormonal based. So if you inject a male, for example, with something like testosterone, you can increase his, his coloration patterns. And so it happens really quickly. I didn't talk too much about it, but the males also have this eye bar that is this black stripe that goes through their eyes. And that's actually an aggressive signal. And they can turn that eye bar on and off um, very quickly within, within a second. And that is actually innervated by a nerve. So that's a neural mechanism. So if you clip the nerve that innervates that eye bar, the eye bar, the eye bar actually stays on. And so Bert has his eye bar on all the time because he's being aggressive. Tyrone has his eye bar off. And so if he turns it on, he's going to be immediately attacked by, by Bert because that is signaling that, oh, I'm trying to be aggressive and I might want to take over your territory. So he shuts it off to appear submissive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the question is about, about Lake Tanganyika and how um, do I think the, the lake has something to do with their, with their life cycle? Oh, does the depth of the lake?
Um, yes and no. So this species is actually not found in the deepest portions of the lake. It's only found in sort of shallow areas around the lake and the river systems. And so they're definitely more of a shallow water species. But because of that, they also have to deal with lots of turbidity in the water. Um, and I've heard my postdoc advisor talk about instances where you get giant hippos walking through these, these areas where these fish are. And once a hippo goes through there, it's all this, this turbid environment. It disrupts all the territories of these males. So Bert and, and Tyrone are kind of scrambling to get their, their territories back. And so I think this species especially also is in a really interesting um, phylogenetic position because it's thought to have given rise to a lot of the species in the other rift lakes like Lake Malawi and Lake Victoria. Um, so it, it could have something with, to do with, with their habitat and why, why they have this structure. But there's also um, other species that live in the deeper portions of the lake that have a similar sort of life history strategy as these guys. So not really sure. Yeah. Is there a reason why the fish want to stay in the lake? To stay in that area? Oh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Probably because it has something to do with what they feed on or um, how they set up their territories. The males set up very clustered territories and they need some shelter that they use to try and you know, use as a habitat to attract females and everything. And so there's, there's a lot more available sort of habitat substrate that they can form their, their territories in. So maybe that keeps them in, the, in those shallow regions. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Yes. How do fish talk? Well, they don't talk like we do and say words or anything where they don't have a, a vocabulary and a language, but they make those little grunt-like sounds by basically compressing the muscles around their swim bladder. And so their swim bladder normally is for buoyancy control, but if they vibrate that swim bladder, it acts like an amplifier and sends these grunt-like sounds out into the, to the water environment. So that's how they make sounds. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So the question is, if if Tyrone sort of challenges someone in in the population, will he get some other physiological characteristics that make him more like a dominant bird? Right. So yeah. So he'll do the color changes, and then um, over time there's a lot of physiological changes that happen. And so one of the main things that happens is he will beef up his reproductive axis. So his testes start to grow, his reproductive system really gets ramped up so he can start making more and more sperm. Um, these fish as males, actually Tyrone has higher growth rates than Bert does. So the strategy there is that Tyrone is gonna eat as much as he can and try and get as big as he can so that he has a better chance of defeating a Bert when he does get that opportunity. Bert's so busy defending his territory and trying to get Tony that he has less time to sort of eat and bulk up his, his physique. And so um, Tyrone has the advantage on that front. And so once he becomes big enough that he thinks he can win a fight without you know, suffering injury, he's, he's going to go for it and try and do it. So yeah, good question. Yeah. All right, we've got the creeper coming up here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give everyone a big, let's, everyone, let's give a big round of applause for Dr. Mershka. Thank you so much. So tonight's, uh, tonight's winner is uh, of the uh, WRKF uh, Science Friday uh, uh, coffee tumbler is Chase Anselmo. Is Chase, Chase is somewhere around here? All right, Chase, okay. So they will contact, we don't have one here for you tonight. They will contact you by email to make arrangements to pick up your, uh, your tumbler. So congratulations. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you everyone online um, uh, for your patience. 
Um, so please be with us next month on April 26th, where we'll hear from Patricia Perso about Louisiana earthquakes. And as a Californian, I'm really interested in this. So thank you all very much. See you next month. Thank you. <laughs>